Hello, my friends. We haven't done a Q&A in quite a while, and I have some time today. I thought I would answer some questions from the last month or so coming from YouTube, Facebook, emails, phone calls, all over the place. We're getting an influx of a lot of new questions and people interested in martial arts because of the video game Ghost of Tsushima. You may have played it. You might be playing it now. Uh, it's become kind of a sleeper hit. It's a samurai game that's come out, an open world type game with ninja, samurai, kenjutsu. And people, therefore, are getting more questions about martial arts that don't know anything about it. Or they're learning through the video game and they want to know more. So I have questions. Some of you have heard these before, but we can always learn something new by listening. Nick Austin asked, You mentioned Cold Steel, which is a company has three different sizes of shuriken. Which one are you using in this throwing video? Nick's probably talking about a shuriken video that I put up a couple years ago. I've done several. Nick, there are three different weights. Now, I don't know if I have them all here of these cold steel shuriken. This is the heavy weight. I think it's called Surefire if you want to order these online. I don't know how many ounces this is, but it's huge and heavy. Sticks in very, very well. The more weight behind the target, the better it's going to stick behind the shuriken. This is a medium weight, thinner, still good quality steel. It's not sharp, but it's pointy. It'll stick. And then you have the lightweight ones. I don't have any here, but they're just called lightweight. Here's one. This is a lightweight. See how thin that is? So this is a shuriken made by Cold Steel. I don't get endorsements from Cold Steel, but that's a good company. What I like about these is they're well made good steel. They're not going to bend. The yellow tape, before you ask, is just so that when we lose them, we can find them. So you can either spray paint these a bright color, so when you throw it and you lose it, you can refind it. I put yellow tape here so that when we miss the target and they roll 30 yards, we can find them in the woods. But we were throwing these last night in class. Uh, there were about 25 of us throwing these out back into these cool targets. I'll put a couple photos up. And these stick quite well. They really do. Then you have other types of shuriken, like this Hira shuriken, which is like a senban, a nail puller. This is a different shape. There's all kinds of different shapes. I like this one. And then you have different shapes like this. These are all good machine steel that someone cut out. They're not sharp, but they're pointy. They'll stick. They'll stick into a wooden wall like I just threw it. Uh, I have wood in the dojo walls, just so you know, because I occasionally throw shuriken. So when you have a business of your own, you can put up wooden walls and make shuriken targets out of them. Uh, but the surefire ones are about 15 bucks a piece, some, some, some cases $20 each. You might find them for 12 or 13 online. Look around, shop around. I recommend if you're a new person, get the heavy ones. And get as many as you can afford. If you get two or three, you're going to be going back and forth to the target hundreds of times. Get, get eight, get ten if you can afford it. That way you can throw longer, figure out your throw. I was throwing some of these last night from 30, 40 yards away. And the, the thinner the shuriken, boy, they really do move more. If you're off just a tiny bit, they go flying. Or if the wind is blowing, the wind will affect these much more than these, just like any type of projectile or bullet. And you have to really throw high and understand how the gravi gravitational drop and all this is going to affect the throw, especially if you're going beyond 20, 30 yards. You start to get 80, 100 feet out, and you'll be lucky to hit the target at all. But it's fun to do. You would never throw the shuriken from long distance because they're designed to be close combat distractors. That's all they are. They couldn't kill anybody, so get that out of your head from these video games. They were designed to throw quickly, and then you would run in as the guy's doing that, kill them with your sword or spear or whatever you had. And the bow shuriken, which I don't have any right here, the spike shuriken, I have a couple dozen at home. Those were the little spikes that you would throw. Much harder to throw, but again, if you get hit by one of those, it'll, it'll knock your eye out if you hit just right, and then you dispatch later. And the samurai carried shuriken much more than ninja, I'm sure, because uh, there were more samurai, and they were probably weapons that they had hidden in their armor, so that if they needed to, they could throw the shuriken and move in with their wakizashi or whatever. Foot soldiers, Ashigaru carried 
shuriken as well. They were not just to the ninja. Because they're so darn cool, people associate this with the shinobi. But uh, anything the shinobi had, the samurai had before. Because the samurai were the military class. They had all this. They had the, the tools, the money. The smiths could make this stuff for them. So, Nick, good luck. Grab a set for yourself and have fun. The shuriken's really cool. If you have a shuriken target at home, whether it's vertical or horizontal, your board lay, it's so much fun to just go out and relax and throw a shuriken. If you're feeling upset or stressed out or angry, hey, you take nine or ten of these and you throw them. You get some exercise, some fresh air, hand-eye coordination. Uh, you're making mistakes. You're learning. It's great at making you a happier person, just practicing. And you get better, better at it. And no one carries these, but if you have a cell phone or you have a handful of stones or you have a dish or a glass or a utensil, you can throw that thing for self-defense as a distracting tool so you can move in and hit or run. So don't underestimate the power of a shuriken. It's a lesser weapon, but it's an effective one at uh, distracting the opponent. Sadie says, I love your channel. Thanks, Sadie. When did you begin training? Sadie, I began in 1980. 1979-80 was my first karate class, and then I got my first black belt at age 15, and I've been training ever since 1980. I haven't stopped at all. Met Hatsumi was the next question. When did you first meet Soke Hatsumi? I met him in 1984 was my first time I met him, and year after we would meet uh, at Taikai. I'm not a friend of his. I didn't know him personally. I've met him many, many times, talked to him a lot. Or a little, I should say, not a lot. Uh, I never, I've been to his house, but I have not, like, he's not a friend of mine. Because there are thousands of people that were doing the same thing I was. I was just another dumb schmuck in the audience of 200 people around him. But as he got older, you could spend more time with him because you, if you went to Japan you can get more time with him because he does come to his dojo and he's not surrounded by a bunch of people. Often he would come in just by himself or with a driver as he gets older. But back in the 80s, with the ninja boom, you couldn't get close to him. You get photographs, autographs, stuff I, you know, I might have up on the wall. But to spend time with him was very unusual. He had to be in the inner circle, which I was not. But because I endured and persevered, uh, I'm one of the few left that still trains from way back then. Most people have dropped off. They might have died by now or um, been injured or just didn't stick with it. So consistency is the key if you want to uh, have your own school one day. You can't be someone who trains for a month or a year and then quits. You have to be consistent. So then I started in Ninjutsu in 1984 was when I met Anshu Stephen Hayes, became one of his students, uh, personal students, and have known him ever since. I moved to Ohio in 1999. Uh, I've been running a school here for 16 years and then another school for another seven or eight before that. So I've been teaching for 25 years or more, training for 41 years now. S most of you weren't born before any of this but it's okay don't let that discourage you you start to train whenever you can if you start to train in 2020 good that's your year to start most people don't realize uh, that before the year 2000 there was an entire other generation of us that were training in martial arts uh, especially in the 1980s that huge ninja boom right after Bruce Lee in the 70s came the ninja boom in the 80s when everything was samurai and ninja Shokosugi movies. This is way before Jackie Chan and all those guys. And you guys might know the Bourne series way before that, way before The Matrix. We old guys that were around that long remember Kane and Kung Fu and uh, Chuck Norris and these guys that were, were starting out back then. It was a really different time. The ninja boom was so popular. Everywhere you went were ninja movies. And that's why I got involved, because I watched the movie Shogun in 1980, I think. Saw Toshiro Mifune on screen. Saw Shintaro Katsu from Zatoichi, and I was like, I want to do that. That's what I want to do. And I, I kept going and never stopped. And as the years go on, 
you see new martial art action stars, Steven Seagal in the 90s, Jackie Chan, all these guys that come come a bit later, Jet Li, they, they, you know, they, they all come at a certain time and then it fades and then you get a new fad. Um, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu was big in the 2000s and that's starting to fade a little bit, but still quite popular. What's cool is as you get old enough, you go through these cycles of martial art booms and things and you can see that it's just a wheel and every time you spin that wheel a new martial art gets prominent and pushed into the public eye then it disappears it goes back but if you want to be a consistent martial artist and you ever want to master anything or get good at it you have to stay on the wheel when it's down low and no one's watching it when it's out of the public eye and when no one cares about it but your dojo is still training when for years after year after year no one pays attention no one cares your love of martial art keeps you going keeps you training in the lowest and the highest of times that's the key to any type of success in life is you do it when no one is looking you do it when there are no accolades and no one's watching you you do it when there's no rank to be had you do it when there's no stripes to be gained you just do it because you love it and that's a uh, that's the key to success, I believe, about anything you do, anything you want to do, practice when no one's around by yourself. Matthew, in all of your years of teaching, have you ever had someone challenge you on the mat? And if so, what happened? Sure, Matthew, over the years, you can't not have someone challenge you. Whether it's a new person that walks in the door that wants to try on your school, or it might be a student that's just disrespectful, that's new and doesn't know protocol, uh, different martial arts might come in and try to challenge you. Yes, I have had that happen. Uh, what you have to do is put them down quickly. No one is going to come in my school and, uh, and disrespect me or my students or our space that we have built. If you come into my school and you challenge me, I'm going to put you on your butt quick, break your arm and push you out the door and maybe call the cops. Uh, that just doesn't happen anymore. This isn't the 1800s where they go around challenging each other. You respect someone when you walk in their dojo, as I do. When I go into someone's dojo, I'm a white belt. I bow down to everybody and teach me something new. I would never go in with arrogance and say, hey, who's your sensei? I want to challenge him. No, that's, that's something that a 17-year-old immature loser does. Uh, and I've had a couple try to challenge me, and I put them down quickly. And then I invite, do not invite them back. I said, you are not allowed back in my school. If you come in again, I'm going to hurt you. If you come in with five of your friends, I'm going to hurt them too. So leave. You're not welcome here. Go start your own dojo and play with your own friends. If you come into my dojo, you respect us, and you respect the tradition, and you don't disrespect the ancestors that have died to bring us this information. How dare you walk into a dojo and pick a fight with a sensei. I mean, it's the height of arrogance, the height of disrespect. It is the, a barbarism that cannot be tolerated. And fortunately, most, 99.9% .9 of people that walk into any dojo are great people. They're friendly, they're nice, they, they have the humility to be taught. They're not arrogant. Uh, and the young ones that do try to press the teachers don't last long because they actually don't like pain. So if you, if you, uh, if you bruise them up, they often don't come back the next day. Martial art teachers do have a way of weeding out the weakest. Um, there is a way to do that, which we'll discuss another time. But I want to stay positive. Kyola Awakens 12. Why is it that young guys think that they are so tough and know it all? This is exactly what I was talking about, about martial arts. Until they feel pain... And then they wince and tap out and scream like a soy baby for their mama. <laughs> I don't know why they do that. Look, <laughs> that's a funny question. You answered it already. I, I don't mean any disrespect because you guys, look, we were all young once, right? But when you're young, you think you're invincible, you're arrogant. You think you're the toughest person in the room, you're the strongest, you're the best looking. But experience trumps all. Experience trumps speed, technique trumps strength. All of these things, when you're young, you don't understand. You, you don't have enough experience in the world. 
So you look at some guy that's 40 or 50 and said, and you think, oh, I can take him. And, and then your arrogance kicks in. And then the guy puts you on your butt in two seconds, taps you out, puts you to sleep in a chokehold or something, because you don't have the experience that he has. And you think that strength and brute force is better than intelligence. It isn't. It never works. Now, pain is something that a lot of people can't deal with. If you're old enough, like me, you have chronic pain from all the injuries you've sustained over the years. A lot of us are in pain out there from arthritis and things like that. But some young people don't know how to deal with pain, so when they feel it, they get scared because what pain does is it ruins your dream. It ruins your expectation. You think that when you walk into a dojo, it's going to be like Ghost of Tsushima. And you're going to have this old guy with a beard that's going to have a sword. and He's going to teach you the ways and you're going to be meditating in three days and, and uh, writing scrolls in a mountain with all the petals coming down from the Japanese oak trees. No. Get that out of your head. Your dream is crushed immediately after the first class when you have to do ukemi for 20 minutes and you're nauseous and dizzy. And then you get hit so hard that you can't breathe or even with the gloves on you get punched in the face or you're on the mat and you get tapped out and your arms twisted behind your back and then you go home and you're bruised and you have to take ibuprofen and you can't sleep from the pain that's what weeds out people who will never be teachers who will never be school owners the ones that can take the pain the quiet ones in the class are almost always the most efficient that is true with most things. The loud, obnoxious people are the ones that leave quickest. They quit the earliest. Their egos can't take any type of competition. The quiet ones in the dojo are the best. They're the ones that come back class after class, and slowly they develop uh, rank, and they develop power in the dojo quietly. And then all of a sudden, the teacher walks over and says, Hey, little Johnny. You want to become a coach? Johnny, because he's humble, says, sure, I'd love to help other people. He's not thinking about how he looks. He's thinking about helping other people. This is compassion. This is what a teacher does. Teacher serves first. Little Johnny's all of a sudden teaching the little kids, and little Johnny's getting better. He's learning how to teach, how to coach, how to help other people. And little Johnny's making tons of mistakes. Year after year, little Johnny coaches. Little Johnny now gets older. He's a teenager now, maybe in his 20s. All of a sudden, the head teacher says, hey, little Johnny, you want a job? Little Johnny says, yes, I'd rather work here than, than go work retail somewhere. They're great. I'm going to pay you so much per hour, says the head instructor. Now little Johnny's running a class by himself with a couple teenagers. He's getting better and better. Now he's cleaning the floors and stuff. He's getting better. The teacher's sharing more knowledge with him. He's, little Johnny gets in on seminars for free on Saturday. And little Johnny goes with the teacher to train somewhere to teach. Now little Johnny's becoming an assistant instructor, a junior instructor. And because little Johnny is an arrogant and boisterous and loud and, and obnoxious, little Johnny becomes an instructor one day. Little Johnny now opens his own school because he learned and took business classes. Little Johnny now has a following of people that now are looking up to him as a role model. All because little Johnny was quiet and shut up and trained and wasn't typing on the internet how cool he was and wasn't all full of bravado. Little Johnny was a nice person. Little Johnny worked his butt off. He went to every seminar that the teacher offered. He never quit. When times got down, he was just as sad and depressed as everybody else, but he kept going. He asked the right questions at the right time. He was at the right time. He had some luck, for sure. But the goal of this whole thing is we are all young at one point, but the path that we take has to do with our attitude, how much we are willing to put up with, if we are open-minded enough to just shut up and listen when the teachers are talking and not think that we are know-it-alls and just to be humble, those are the people that end up at the top of the mountain. The ones that think they know it all end up taking a different path and usually they fall off a precipice a few years in. Or they get mixed up with the wrong crowd. Or they have no business sense about them. They're morally or ethically uh, questionable. 
So they get involved with the law or they start hitting their wife or something. All kinds of bad things can happen just by one little choice in your life. So my teachers always taught me, choose carefully. Listen to the question twice before you answer quickly. You have one mouth and two ears for a reason. Listen twice as much as you speak and you'll get ahead in life. And it has worked. It's not guaranteed. Nothing is. But it can work. And I hope all of, all of the people watching will listen to their teacher a little bit more than they might have before because the answers are right there. KD A King says, You sound like Jack Black trying to be a sensei. Thank you. I like Jack Black. And if I sound like him, cool. He's a, he's a great guy, very nice person. I like his movies. I loved him in the uh, the music movie. What was the name of it? That movie where he's the music teacher. You'll know. You'll put it in the comments. But great movie. I love him. I watch him on YouTube when his channel comes on. You know how he keeps saying he's going to play... Um, he never plays the video games. He, oh, he says he doesn't have time every week. It's a joke. But I love him. He's a great guy. Yosef Ben Ya says, I want to train at your dojo. Yosef, you can train anytime you want. Just get to Cincinnati and train with us. We're here all the time, 12 hours a day. Uh, you have to make the commitment to buy the ticket, get here wherever you're from, and have enough money that you can sustain yourself during the week with food and stuff. Get a hotel. Train with us. Come. We're always open. We're here all the time. We've been here for 15 years. So there's no excuse why someone out there can't come and train with us. That's what I did. I moved a thousand miles to train with my teacher. I up and moved, rented a U-Haul, saved up some money, worked two jobs, went and trained, got my black belt with my teacher. Anything in life is possible as long as you remove the first obstacle, which is yourself. If you think you can do it, you can. If you think you can do it, and then the next day say, oh, I can't do it, you'll never do it. You'll never attain any goal. You'll never get to where you want to be. But if you can keep thinking, I can do this, I can do this, and crash through your obstacles and uh, make mistakes but learn by them, you'll do it. You'll, you'll do whatever you want to do in life. A random CB player writes, Do you have a recommendation for a place for weapons training in the Houston area? Yes. Go online and search. Be a ninja. Be an intelligence gatherer. Just go out there and look. I don't know the Houston area. I'm not from there. There must be dozens of teachers. With the COVID crisis, they might be kind of hiding right now, or they might not be able to afford their rent. So a lot of websites I've gone to are down because the schools, sadly, are closing. A lot of friends of mine, sadly, are closing their schools because they don't have enough students to sustain the rent, to sustain where they train. So the sensei is forced to close his or her doors, and they have to go get a job doing something else. They would love to have you as a student. So wherever you live, find a teacher, find a martial art that you like, a teacher that you look up to who inspires you. Try out a free class, uh, and then sign up. And maybe your teacher will be able to afford the rent next month. And maybe uh, you can stick with them and support them and earn your black belt or a higher degree one day. Go for it. But Google is our friend. Google has a lot of good stuff out there. Or just talk to people. David Edmund Jr. asks, Do you like fiction? Did you read The Ninja by Eric Von Lustbader? Yes, I have read that book. I don't read a lot of fiction, David. Um, I really like nonfiction. So my library at home has hundreds of books on nonfiction. I, I always had a weird... Some of you out there will agree I had a weird brain with that when I read fiction, I got very bored very easily. Are you like that out there? I only have about five books out of hundreds that are fiction, like The Hobbit, Lord of the Rings. Those can, those can sustain, but I always have to be learning something. I used to read like manuals on how to make things or the, the TV guide. You know, so I, would, I would read things that I was learning from, martial art books. So to read a, a story about a martial artist, I would not have interest in. But I have read The, uh, the Ninja by Lustbader. I think that was from the 80s, maybe. That's an old book. But I don't have any modern fiction books. I only like to read non-fiction books that I'm learning from. But I'm sure there are a ton of good stories about Samurai Ninja that I'm not familiar with. I'm not 
in any way an expert on that, so I couldn't tell you. But for myself, I, I only like to read nonfiction. What is the proper length of a hanbo? Is it still 36 inches? Hold on a second. All right, you guys still with me? I hope you have time in your day to hang out. That's a great question about the hanbo length and things of sticks. Okay, length does matter. Hanbo is typically 36 inches. This is a standard size. I don't know where the 36 inches came from. I think that's almost just something that uh, people came up with. The length of the stick is determined by your height. So 36 inches is okay for what we call the half, half staff, half stick, the Hanbo or uh, San Shakubo. This is good for hiking, for walking, for self-defense, but a hanbo for me is longer than 36 inches because I'm six foot two. Used to be six three, but you shrink as you get older. So a hanbo for me, I would want 38, maybe 40 inches. That would be a hanbo for me. So it's as long as my arm here and then some more. But 36 inches is a stereotypical size that you see sold on martial art stores around the world because that's probably just the way they cut them three foot cut but depending on your height 36 inches was for a short japanese person maybe back in the 1600s they were short people we have evolved where we're much taller now so a lot of people are over six feet tall this is too short for you a joe which is the next size up here is a Joe, which is, I don't know, anywhere from 40 to 52 inches, maybe, maybe 54. But this Joe, which is four or five feet, is too short for me as a Joe. I need a Joe that's about five inches longer because I'm taller. So the height of the stick, again, if you're an average height person, five, 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 six, 36 inch Hanbo would be good. Whatever the typical Joe is is fine, but if you're taller, you've got to add more inches onto it. A bow, this staff here, this is six feet. Is that, what's that, 72 inches? That's typical. A six-foot staff is typical. Why? Because you pay more for shipping if it's over six feet. So a lot of these things that were written in history are not true. A six-foot staff or a four-foot-five Japanese warrior was much taller than him, so that was good. If you're six foot five, you need a seven foot five stick or more. Six two, so I need a seven foot staff or more. That's a lot taller than six, because you want the reach. And in Kukishin Ryu, one of the schools that we use, you have to reach. It's not like Okinawan where you hold the staff here. You really have to reach. So talk to your teacher if you're not sure, but six foot's okay if you're average size, but if you're taller, you're going to have to have one made or manufactured or handmade by people. Like this one was handmade for me. It's made of purple ipe wood, or it might be a, I don't know, it's an exotic wood, and this one's octagonal. That was handmade by somebody. This is a, it's a $120 bow staff. Uh... You get what you pay for. If you buy a cheap red oak for 25 bucks, it'll break and it'll splinter and it'll put splinters in your hand. So just like anything in life, you guys, the general rule is you get what you pay for. And if you want a good weapon, invest the money to buy one that is customized to your size, weight, etc. And buy the best quality wood you can. But uh, don't go buy what's standard. Go buy what is best for you. Shoji writes, Shintaro Katsu or Sonny Chiba? So he's asking about two Japanese actors. Shintaro Katsu, any day. Sonny Chiba, I never liked his movies. They were okay. Really poorly made. Cheesy ninja movies from the 60s and 70s. Shintaro Katsu was, was Zatoichi. His movies were much better made, much better produced, better directed, better acted, better fight scenes. Less cheese, uh, so Shintaro Katsu any day over Sonny Chiba. Now, I walked into the, um, the... Shintaro Katsu died of cancer in 1997. Too young, who played Zatoichi. 
the National Cancer Center in Kashiwa in Japan, I actually walked right by that building. And it was really cool because that was the building where he died. Now, I, I don't know him, obviously. I never met him or anything. He was way before my, my birth. But it was really cool just to, to know the building. I looked up. I didn't go in the building, but I could see the building, the cancer center where he died. And that was really an important moment on my trip to Japan because um, he was a role model of mine. He had some of the best sword fights in movies I've ever seen, and he was a real expert at the uh, the Shikomizue and other things and the straight sword. Fantastic. Someone else on here wrote about, um, yeah, Shinobi Ghost or Shinobu Host writes, did you like the Zatoichi remake in, in 2003? That was the movie that starred uh, Takeshi Kitano or beat Takeshi. It was horrible. I don't know about you guys if you saw the remake in 2003 of Zatoichi. I thought it was terrible. Beat Takano is not a swordsman, and you can tell. Everything was CGI'd. The blood, you know, he cut somebody. And the CGI blood looked like a 10 year old did it. It was horrible. The fight scenes were terrible. The dancing was really cool. The way that they choreographed the dancing with the carpentry and stuff. So there's a couple good scenes, like every movie. The acting, eh. It was just really a poorly made movie. It looked like it was made on a weekend budget. Uh, and that doesn't mean it's a good or bad movie, but I thought I thought the movie was just an insult to... Sh you, you know, you go and watch the old Zatoichi with Shintaro Katsu, and he has like 60 movies. He embodies that character. You watch the new one, and it's almost an insult. Why do, why do they always have to remake classics? Well, I know why, because people aren't, aren't writing anything original now and they think it's easy money, when you have a movie and you recreate it, if you're a producer, you're like, it's a money maker. Why would I want to risk a new script and lose all of my financial investment when I can copy an old movie, like Star Wars or whatever, and, and make cash off of it from the old people that watched it? Well, sadly, Zatuich is another case of Hollywood failing at allowing new scripts to come in and new movies to be made. And that's a Japanese-made movie, but it doesn't matter what country you're in. A producer's a producer, and they're all about money. They're not about the art, most of them. Hasbro King Kong, what do you say to those people who think martial art training should be free of charge? Would old samurai masters train disciples for free? No, they would absolutely not. If you study history, you'll know that samurai masters were for, former military people. When the uh, Sengoku Jidai ended, what did all of the military do when they no longer needed the military? They were fired. They were let go of. There was no budget anymore. No one was fighting wars in armor. No more horses. So what do you do if you're a sword teacher? Well, you teach the sword. And what do you do? You look for work. Instead of being a ronin, you try to find someone with a little money. And you teach and you open a dojo. There were hundreds and hundreds of dojos that opened in the Edo period. And what they were were old samurai guys that knew something about the sword or they've seen live battle and they opened their own dojos. And of course they had to be paid. To think that you can go to a teacher and say, teach me for free is, I believe, just the height of arrogance. Again, we're going back to that. Would I ever demand, would I ever have the guts to walk into a doctor's office and go to the doctor, look, doctor, I'm, I'm, I'm hurting, I need some medicine, but I actually just want you to give that all to me free. Or would I go when my engine's broken in my car and say to a mechanic who's been working for 40 years, uh, look, Bob, um, I'm not going to pay you for this. I'd like you to give it to me free, okay, because that's the code. That's the code of the car. Can you imagine that? People deserve to be paid for their expertise. I would never go to a place and demand free service. Your teacher deserves to be paid. He or she has worked hard. And a lot of the money that you're paying them goes for rent and lights and stuff like that and air conditioning so you're comfortable. And you wouldn't believe the amount of insurances I have to pay for liability in case I break someone's leg or something. Uh, to keep a place like this open costs thousands of dollars per month tens of thousands 
it is not easy. That's why most people do not have a martial arts school. It's because it's incredibly hard, not just to open one with capital, but to maintain it. And then you get students that quit every month. So you have to always have new students coming in to pay the bills. That's just the way it is. So what do you think of people that should have it free of charge? I say absolutely not. If you have worked 10, 20, 30 years, you deserve to be paid, just like the doctors, dentists, lawyers, businessmen, merchant down the street, the lady that's been doing Mary Kay for 20 years, uh, the landscaper that's been doing it for 10. You don't have them mow your lawn for free. You pay them. You pay the plumber. You pay the electrician. You pay everybody. Pay people for what they're worth. They didn't go to school for nothing. God, the arrogance of people to think that they deserve something, that you deserve it free, is beyond me. And that's what we need to stop, is some, some people nowadays just are so entitled, they think that they, everything, they deserve everything, and they don't want to work hard for anything. Be careful of that. Shahonaz Karim asks, I wonder if Bruce Lee would be able to beat a well-trained swordsman. What do you guys think? Could Bruce Lee beat a well-trained swordsman? A lot of people don't even know who Bruce Lee is now because uh, they're younger. They, they don't know who he is. Now, if, the, if it was Bruce Lee against a guy with a sword who was trained, no, Bruce Lee would be dead in a second, no doubt. He was, he was an action movie star, you know. Um, don't put people up on a pedestal too high, especially actors. They pretend for a living, so be careful of that. Um, I respect them, but... Bruce Lee was a good martial artist. He knew a lot. And what I loved about him is he was open-minded. He threw away what didn't work and kept what worked. And he would explore the martial arts. And he was very smart philosophically. And he was held back in his movies. A lot of his movies are not good. A lot of the fight scenes are not choreographed very well. I don't believe that they showed his true intention and his true talent. Boy, I think some of the choreographers now could have gone back and done fight scenes with Bruce Lee that would have been so much more dynamic and would have shown off Mr. Lee's uh, prowess, his physical conditioning. Imagine like the a John Wick movie with Bruce Lee, how cool that would be now with the firearms and stuff and the different martial art moves instead of a standard high sidekick to the face. I would love to have seen Bruce Lee survive and live to be in his 60s and 70s. I, I just would love to have, hear, to, to have heard what he said. But a well-trained swordsman, uh, it's not the weapon, it's the person holding it. So you can give two people swords and the guy that knows some technique will probably win. Not always. Might have luck in there. But does Bruce Lee have a sword and the guy has a sword? Is Bruce Lee unarmed and the guy has a sword? Does Bruce Lee have a sword and the guy has no sword? All of these, that, it's a hard question to answer. Off the bat, I say no. If the guy's got a sword, he's got a huge advantage. Just like a guy with a pistol at 20 yards. I don't care how good you are with a sword, he's going to shoot you. So either you dodge the bullets and run close and get him, or you run away. But firearm is superior over a sword at long distance, no doubt. I'm taking up way too much of your time. Either you're asleep, bored, angry, or maybe you're enjoying this, I hope. Go da Flow writes, Your knowledge is unparalleled. That's not true, but thank you. Not a boring video at all. Is it possible to find a well-made budget wakizashi? Is there such a blade? How much should one be looking to spend? Mainly the blade would be for display, but I'd like to cut if necessary. Great video, by the way. Hold on a second, I'll answer your question. Okay, I brought two examples here for you to see. Go da flow. This is a wakizashi with an aluminum alloy blade, so it's poor quality. Bendable blade, aluminum alloy is a softer metal, and if you bend it, it will bend and stay that way. Won't chip as easily. Well, it will chip easier, sorry. Uh, dulled, it's an EI, it's, a, it's a, not a Shinkan, it's a dulled blade. The tip, Boshi here is very dull. Uh, so you could use this for display or for training. Wakizashi just means side sword. 
some call it a shoto or small sword. So this is all right for display. These will cost you anywhere from forty to a hundred dollars. A lot of the times, the price that you're paying that's higher is for the fittings, like the suba guard and things like that. How well the uh, suka ito is wrapped, you'll pay more for that. But the blades are often stamped out or machine made or mass produced. For display though, fine, but I wouldn't be training too much with that. You get what you pay for. If you're going to train with it, get one that's made of stainless steel. Here's a wakizashi with a stainless steel blade. Tough, tough quality. That's not going to break easily. can still break. Still an EI. It's non-sharp. Better quality blade than the aluminum alloy. Better fittings on this one, so this is probably an $80 sword, maybe. But again, you can pay anywhere from, you can pay $10,000 for one of these. You can pay 500 bucks and get one that's handmade and hammer it out. But this will hold up. You hit that, you know, you clash it together. The, uh, the blade's going to hold up. The mune's going to hold up. It's not going to snap. It's quite rigid. So this is good for display or for practicing. Now, if you want to cut what you talked about, if you want to do some tamishigiri, you need to have a sharp blade. Now, not all blades are created the same, just like a gun. If you get one with a sharp blade, that doesn't mean it's super sharp. Sometimes when they come from the factory, they're sharp, but they're not razor sharp. So you might want to have a professional in your area resharpen them, someone that knows how to really sharpen with stones. Uh, there are guys out there that sharpen swords for a living or blades. So find somebody that can sharpen your sword more so that when you're cutting through uh, mats or whatever that you'll get through it easily. But if you have a sharp sword you shouldn't be training with it. So it depends on what you want the weapon for. Is it for display? Is it for practice at your dojo? Is it for hitting with your back friend in the yard? Then you might want to get a bow can, a wooden sword or a shinai. If you're going to cut with it, you need a solid blade. You get what you pay for. Pay three, four hundred bucks for one. Get a nice blade that you can cut with. It's a great question, though. I'm sorry to say a lot of the answers to these have to do with what you pay. If you pay forty dollars, you get forty dollars worth of wakizashi. If you pay four hundred, you're going to get a much better quality sword. It's going to last you longer. What is your opinion on implementing ground game or ground defenses in your style? Does ninjutsu have any ground game? Is jujitsu better than ninjutsu? Depends on the person. Most ninjutsu does not have much ground game. We have a few techniques in the old days, but we have, in our dojo, we have a lot of ground defenses because it it's makes perfect sense. In 1999 was the first time that I saw Brazilian jujitsu, uh, UFC stuff, we adopted it in our martial art because it was so effective. So we started to do these flows and these drills all on the ground, 30 movements, front, forward, udo mote, left and right, back and forward. And we would get really good at ground defenses, mounts and uh, half guards and kimudas and what they call americanas and all that. All these old techniques like onikudaki and uh, mushidori, it's the same thing on the ground. But you had to learn about re relaxing and how to use space and how to constrict at the right time and how, how to look two or three moves ahead. Ground fighting is very good at strategy. Yet, for self-defense, being on the ground is very unintelligent. If you go out in the cement and you roll around, you're going to destroy your body. And I, I've always said to my BJJ friends, go out, go out and roll around in the tar over there, on the hot tar in a 100 degree day for about 10 minutes and see how your body reacts. None of them want to do it. But ground fighting is awesome. It's really powerful. And you can be a really good striker, and then you go up against a wrestler, and you might think, oh, I'm going to knock him out. No, I don't think so. I think the wrestler is going to shoot in on your legs, do a double leg takedown, and you're going to be done with. He's going to tap you out or choke you out. Yet arrogance in ninjutsu is prevalent. So a lot of the ninja or karate guys out there say, we're a stand-up martial art. We don't go to the ground. It's beneath us. No, what that is is either your teacher never taught you and didn't know any ground stuff, or you're arrogant, 
or you're arrogant. You're a know-it-all. You don't think that you will ever go to the ground. Well, any, anyone out there knows who's been training and it's worth their salt knows that a lot of fights end up on the ground, a huge percentage. You better know what you're doing when someone my size is mounting you because you ain't going to move me easily if I'm sitting on you punching your face in. So you better know how to, how to bridge and gap and stuff like this and get me close and wrap me and stuff. You're going to have to know this. It's not always about strength. Yes, we do ground defenses. We have a DVD on it. Uh, we're not the best at it by any means. There's no doubt that Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu schools are better at ground fighting than we are. No doubt. Uh, but I know enough to survive, escape, and break an arm on the way, but I'm by no means an expert at ground fighting. I, if, if you want, if I've had people walk in the dojo and say, look, I want to do ground fighting. I say, go to the uh, Gracie school over there. Go to the jiu-jitsu school over there. My friend in Westchester has a school. Go over there. Because our ground fighting is probably about 10% here, maybe less. We're into mostly striking, kicking, grappling, ground defenses, weapons, mind science, meditation, strategy, uh, life skills, you name it. We do a lot of that here, joint manipulation, judo throws. But ground fighting strictly is, you want to go to a school that does that as a sport jiu-jitsu. That's what I recommend. But they ask, uh, does ninjitsu as a martial art have a ground game? I would say no. But there are a few schools that I respect that have adopted ground movements into their curriculum, and that's good. Is jiu-jitsu better than ninjutsu? No. No martial art is better than another. It is the practitioner, in my opinion, not the art. Jiu-jitsu is what they used to call the old style of unarmed combat. So the jiu-jitsu being done now is nothing new. It's from ancient Japan. The Kamuda is an Oni Kodak, you know what I mean? All these, all these new names are just rehashed names that people regave to the sport part of it, but it's nothing new. Now, they come up with new techniques all the time, but an Oni Kodaki is an Oni Kodaki, a Mushidori is a Mushidori, and it was called something else before it was called that. So to call something an Americana now is just a new name for an old technique. But there are people out there that take it to a whole new level that do this eight hours a day that can beautifully transform an Oni Kudaki and do it five different ways from five different attacks. I love those guys. I have so many friends that do jujitsu and I love them. And we, we talk, we roll, we have fun. Remember in martial arts, you wanna, you wanna make friends with people. You wanna be brothers and sisters. You, want, you don't want to compete with your dojo friend, uh, local dojo. You want to make friends with them because you're going to see them at certain events. Uh, and you want to be friends. You want to cross talk. You want to cross train and just treat them nicely. That way, when they want to do ninja or samurai stuff, they recommend your school like I do to others. Philip Hanna says, on the subject of suicide, you wrote that it's cowardly. You wrote cowardly? I don't know. I think it'd take a lot of balls to kill yourself. That doesn't make it okay, obviously, but I think that the notion that committing suicide is cowardly is almost a way to deter people from doing it. With all so purpose to risk, there's no such word as what you wrote. Um, maybe purposeful you were writing? Anyway, if they have the resolve to commit suicide, I don't see the reverse psychology to prevent it. Anyway, very cool video. Love the content. Thank you, Philip. Philip, I think I agree with what you're saying because you really worded your question well. Um, you agree that it's not okay to kill yourself. I agree. The, the odds of us coming into this world are staggering. One in billions and trillions. So to throw a life away, I throw out the word cowardly because it's a tough subject to talk about, and I'm not taking it lightly by any means. If you feel that way, please seek out an expert. If you're feeling suicidal, that your life isn't worth anything, I implore you to go to a local doctor and talk to them. 
psychology, psychiatry, anything you can do. Therapy of any kind is brilliant. I recommend it highly. If you kill yourself, it's cowardly. In my opinion, look at the damage that you know you cause to your family, friends, and loved ones. You, you haven't just taken your own life, you've taken theirs as well. And they have to live with that for the next 30, 40 years of what you did. It takes a stronger person to keep going and to keep living and to fight their way through it. And anyone watching this has that strength innately from birth in you. We can be in the darkest places in our lives, the saddest place, the most oppressive place you can imagine. But if you're in that place, you were at another place before. And you can get back up to that place at some point. Remember, there is no dark without light. You can get to the light again. It'll take help. It'll take effort. It'll take years of ups and downs. It'll take falling back a few times. But anyone out there in the sound of my voice, nothing I can say can really change your mind. You have to change it yourself. And that takes training. Just like we trained last night on the mat, you have to go to a psychologist, psychiatrist, a therapist, and let them be your sensei and help you through the process. Work your way through the anger and the depression so that one day you'll be able to see that light again and you'll be able to rediscover the beauty of who you are and you'll be able to rediscover just how darn wonderful life is and you'll be able to appreciate and respect life. I respect life by continuing to live in it in all the suffering that we go through every single day and all the pandemics and the death and stuff and the, the cruelty around us and the evil, I continue to endure and to persevere, nin, and get through it. And it affects me just as much as everybody else. But I'm not going to give up on it. I'm not going to give up on my ancestors and my parents who gave me this life. Whether you know them or not, they gave you a life. Respect them and earn it and live it to the best and fight to stay alive as long as you can. Fight that cancer, fight that disease, fight through the pain. This is spirit, the spirit that's real. The real spirit is from here. It's, it's real because you can do it with the physical. It's really a hard subject. And I don't take it lightly. Please don't misunderstand me. But my God, live your life. Live it. Don't take it and make the others suffer around you. You are worth it. Do you know how many people had to die to get to where you were? Our lineage is unbroken. We've evolved. And not one of our ancestors could have died to prevent you from being here today. If your parent died, if your grandparent, your great, one of them died, you wouldn't be here right now. Thinking about this, having the beauty to ponder it even, having the brain to comprehend it, to think about it, to ask for help when you need it. Now I have a bunch more questions here. I'm not going to go any further because this is a really heavy spot. Um, let's leave it here, okay everybody? Uh, again, if you feel anything like this, and these videos help you or watching martial arts on YouTube helps you wonderful if watching our little channel helps you or you like the other guys channel better great go there but if you feel depressed and sad I'm empowering you now that you have the ability hopefully with help to change that don't let anyone tell you it's hopeless it is not life is beautiful it is grand it is rare it is full of wonder that way outweighs any suffering. When we have bad days, know that you are not alone and that thousands or many, many thousands of people have been exactly where you are. And they have found a way through it, so far, so can you. None of us are immune to any of this stuff. But there are books, there are lessons, there are teachings right here on YouTube or wherever you go there's wisdom in your grandparents, if you ask for help with your parents, if you find a mentor, expect disappointment from people, 
because the more that you raise someone up, the more that they will disappoint you. Know that no relationship out there, no amount of money, no job lost, all of this can be remedied, every part of it. If you believe in yourself, if you're confident, and you can find and ask for help when you need it. And then if you can bring out the warrior within you to know that you're worth it. You are here on this earth for whatever amount of time for a purpose. And the purpose is from here. You can do whatever you put your mind to. You can accomplish your goals. You can go toward your dreams. You can find love and money and whatever you want. But to live and to exist is a gift. And it is something none of us should take lightly. On that note, my friends, it has been way too long. I bored you out of your skull. I'm going to go back and do some work before we train later on. Tonight we're doing Classical Budo, which is a class we do every Wednesday where we take a scroll and a technique from like 400 years ago and we practice the technique and the attack and the defense several different ways and then we modernize it and say what would he have done if he was in John Wick? What would he have done if he was wearing a backpack? What would he have done if he had a small shiv knife instead of a samurai sword? Well we don't wear armor now but we wear t-shirts and shorts. What would they have done in work boots? What would they have done if it was raining outside? How would we do this against someone that's bigger than us? How would we do this if they attacked us from behind? How would I do this kata on the ground? This is what the class does every Wednesday, and it's one of our most popular and favorite classes because everybody that does the curriculum classes wants something different, wants to go back into the history. And a lot of schools don't touch the history. There's no depth in their teacher. But I know a lot of these techniques from many years ago. I've collected them over the years. I have notebooks this thick from the old days of Hatsumi and, and all my other teachers where I can go in and just pull out a technique and say, hey, let's work on this for an hour. Let's, let's extract the principles from it and then adapt it to modern day fighting and see how it can protect ourselves and our family. I love this stuff. I wake up every day, you guys, craving this stuff. So I appreciate your questions, and I, I didn't answer them all. I apologize, but for now, continue to write. Um, I don't see all of the comments, but I try, and I have a moder moderator that helps me out, uh, that keeps the channel clean. But keep writing, keep training wherever you are. If you're um, at home from the COVID stuff, you can still train. You can still solo train in your backyard or your apartment, wherever. Uh, support your teachers, support your local dojos, no matter what the art. Take care of each other, take care of your family, take care of yourself. And I will see you next time, my friends. Have a great day. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.